Today we're going to go on a journey, a journey back through time to long, long ago. To you, that probably means when your granny was born. And yes, that was a long time ago, probably over 70 years ago. And when your granny's granny was born, that would be over a hundred years ago. But we're going much further back than that. So when your granny's 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 granny was born. And that was ages ago, about 1,200 years in fact. And the world then was a very different place. Take the island of Lindisfarne where I am today. There was only one building. It was a monastery just up there where those ruins are behind me. Within those walls, the monks would go about their daily business, attending church services and studying holy writings. They also created beautiful works of art, like this page from the Lindisfarne Gospel. But one day their peace was interrupted. Out at sea, sails appeared on the horizon. They came nearer and nearer. Eventually, they found their way just around that little bend there and approached the beach here where these fishing boats are drawn up. Then fierce warriors armed with swords and shields and axes leapt out. All too soon, the monks found out what the fearsome strangers had come for. They were there to plunder to steal and to kill. It was all soon over. The raiders returned to their ships laden with treasure and disappeared eastwards as suddenly as they had appeared. News of the raid swept through England and people weren't just frightened, they were baffled. Who were these mysterious raiders? Nobody seemed to have the first idea. I expect you know who they were. That's right, the Vikings. And it's the Vikings that we'll be finding out about for the next five weeks. When the Vikings sailed away from Lindisfarne, they returned to Scandinavia, to the countries of Denmark, Sweden and Norway. Much of Scandinavia is rocky and mountainous, and the winters are cruelly cold. A landscape like this is hard and tough, but so too were those early Vikings. The Vikings lived mostly in small settlements. Sometimes the houses were made of stone and turf, and sometimes they were made of wood. It depended on what materials were available in the neighbourhood. As for the Vikings themselves, they weren't full-time soldiers. For most of the time, they were fishermen and farmers. There was plenty of fish to be had in the sea. Some of the land was suitable for growing crops. Sometimes the work was done by slaves that they had captured on their raids. They were also helped by young children, like yourselves, because Viking children didn't go to school. One of the most important people on the settlement was the blacksmith who worked in the forge and his job was to make the everyday tools used on the farm and in the household and also to make the weapons that they used on the raids, things like this very heavy sword here. To find out how that was done, I've come to visit a blacksmith who works quite close to Lindisfarne. His name's Daryl Smith. Quite an appropriate name for a blacksmith, don't you think? Hi, Daryl. How you doing? Hi. You're working on a sword just now? Yes, that's right. I'm just uh, getting it hot in the fire to make the metal soft so that I can hammer it out on the, f on the anvil. Because it starts out originally very hard like this, doesn't that's it? That's right, yes. Yeah. So that's what it's like when it's cold. Show us what it's like now that it's warm. So it has to go back in now to heat it back up That's again? That's right, yes. Right. You scared the life out of me there with all those sparks. <laughs> yes, it's actually uh, like the surface of the metal actually goes molten. And as you hit it with a hammer, the sparks and the molten stuff fly off.
I mean, stop you. You've been at it now for a few hours, and I can see that it's taking mm -hmm. shape, but how many more hours until we have the finished sword? Um, it depends, but to do the job properly, the whole thing would take a uh, week and a half, maybe two weeks. So it's quite a lot of your time, isn't yes. it? Yes. To a Viking, then, was the sword quite an important thing to have? Yes, it would have been a very valuable possession, uh, probably handed down from father to son for generations. Were the different standards of swords, were some better than others? Yes, just like anything else, um, depending, I suppose, on how much you could afford to pay. Um, there would have been swords that would have been better quality than others. And how would you make a sword strong? Um, by dipping in water, um, like this. This is a sword that Daryl made recently, and if we look at the hilt, you'll see that there are a series of lines scratched on it. They're called runic letters, and they're made up of a series of straight lines. That's because the Vikings didn't use pen or paper. What they used to do is to scratch their letters on perhaps wood or stone or metal. And it's far easier to scratch a straight line than a curved line. In fact, try it after the program, you'll see exactly what I mean. These particular runic letters make up the name of the sword. In fact, they say that it's called Leg Biter. The Vikings... And they gave each other nicknames too. In fact, some of the first invaders of England had names like Ivor the Boneless, Olaf the Stout, and Ragnar Hairy Breeks. <laughs> Sounds quite funny, doesn't it? But there was nothing funny about coming face to face with these warriors on the battlefield, as the English had started to find out. Since that first raid on Lindisfarne, the Vikings had come back time after time. They'd learnt that there were many other monasteries, all rich in gold and silver, and just the right target for a raiding party. The attacks continued, until finally they sent not just a small band of raiders, but an entire army. This time they intended to conquer England and stay there. Ivor the Boneless led the first invasion, and it wasn't long before he'd conquered the north of England. Next, they moved south. Army after army was routed, and soon the only place that held out was the Kingdom of Wessex. The King of Wessex was a man called Alfred, and Alfred fought a series of battles against the Vikings. The decisive battle happened at a place called Eddington. fighting was ferocious, and for a long time the result hung in the balance. But in the end, it was Alfred's men who proved the stronger. It was a total victory for Alfred and the English. In fact, if it wasn't for the Battle of Eddington, the Danes would probably have conquered England. And we'd be speaking Danish now, not English. As it was, Alfred made the Danes live in an area of the north which became known as Danelaw. And this is where the Vikings settled and stayed. Another thing that Alfred made them do was to become Christians. Up until then, the Vikings had been pagans. That means that they worshipped many different gods. But although they promised to become Christians, they didn't give up their old gods straight away. Have a look at this. It's a cross put up by the Vikings. Well, over the centuries, the wind and rain has worn the cross away a little bit. So the school across the road have made a wooden copy, and it's much easier to see the detail. For instance, over here, you can see Jesus hanging on the cross. That's the traditional Christian image. But all around it are gods and monsters from the old Viking world. For instance, over here is Heimdall. You'll notice that he's lying on his side and about to be eaten by a couple of dragons. Heimdall was the sentry to the gods. The gods were thought to live in a place called Asgard. And the most important of all was one-eyed Odin, the god of wisdom and war. He's here on the side on horseback. And you can see him just behind me, there. 
Odin knew everything. He had two ravens called Memory and Thought, and every morning at dawn, Memory and Thought would fly off around the world to find out everything that was happening. In the evening, they would return to Odin, perch on his shoulder and tell him all that they'd seen. There were many other gods, but perhaps the best loved of all was Thor. He was immensely strong and he had a fiery hammer that he used against his enemies. But as well as being strong, Thor liked eating and drinking and having a good time. And the Vikings made up many stories about him. Here's one of the best of those stories, Thor's visit to the giants. If there was one thing Thor liked, it was a new challenge. And that's what he had now. He was off to test his strength against the arch rivals of the gods, the giants of Utgard. The hall of the giants was four days' march away, and Thor had taken two friends to keep him company. The three of them made good progress, but at the end of the third day, they were feeling a little foot sore, and Thor called a halt. Time to rest up, he said. Let's look for shelter. By now, they were in a forest, and it was getting dark. But they could just see in front of them what looked like a strange kind of building. The entrance at one end was as wide as the building itself. Anyone at home? There was no reply. Right, in we go. Inside, it was even stranger. There was no furniture and no wall hangings. It was completely bare. But the three of them weren't bothered. They were so tired they could have slept anywhere. And for three hours, that's exactly what they did. Out like a light. But then they were woken up by a roaring and a rumbling. Thor was first on his feet. Get further inside. There's some sort of monster outside. And while the other two sleepily found their way down another smaller passage, Thor mounted guard at the doorway. The rumbling continued off and on throughout the night. But whatever it was outside came no closer. And finally, Thor went off to sleep as well. Next morning, as soon as the sun was up, Thor ventured outside. It didn't take him long to find out what had been making all the noise. For there, stretched out in the clearing, was an enormous giant, fast asleep. Yes, the rumbling they had heard was the giant snoring. Just as Thor was wondering whether to use his hammer, the giant woke up. Well, well, Thor of the gods, if I'm not mistaken. And who gave you permission to sleep in my glove? Glove, thought Thor. What glove? But when he looked round, he realised that the strange house they had spent the night in was... No wonder it had been so short of furniture. The giant seemed friendly enough. So Thor explained his plans to him. They were on their way to Utgard, and perhaps the giant would be kind enough to show them the way. Why not? I'm going halfway there myself. And if you like, I'll carry those bags for you. You look as though you're a bit tired from the journey. <laughs> 